A bearded man, looking nervous, told Eugene he was asking for too much. He had a princely look, with Roman as his aide. The Cajetan Emer said he wouldn't send his subordinates for petty thievery. Eugene, unconcerned about intentions, was harmed in the process. Nervously, the Cajetan Emer claimed they were protecting Eugene, explaining the bad blood between Nahama's Sultan and Kiel's Emperor. He mentioned desert mages causing desertification at the end of the desert. The Cajetan Emer insisted he was only protecting Eugene, suggesting Nahama was bowing down to Kiel. He asked why Eugene was heading to the deserted Kajani Desert. Eugene reminded him it wasn't an interrogation. The Kajetani Emer exclaimed that's the point and made his men follow Eugene to protect him. He blamed Rahman for not properly carrying out orders and mentioned hearing Eugene attack his men first despite distancing themselves. Eugene smirked when he realized that the Kajetani Emer hadn't mentioned the assassins or desert mages. It seemed like the Kajetani weren't aware of Hamel's grave and Amelia Merwin. Eugene chose not to bring it up and decided to step back after reaching a resolution. He admitted to misunderstanding but worried about explaining the situation to the Lionheart family. Eugene stated that his life had been in danger, and his family wouldn't take it lightly. This made the Kajitani Emer concerned. Eugene mentioned that he didn't want it to escalate and cause issues between the two countries. The Kajitani Emer then inquired about Eugene's desires, and Eugene promptly requested 500 million cells. He argued that it was a fair amount to clear up the misunderstanding. Despite being only 19 years old, the Kajitani Emer was impressed by Eugene's boldness. Eventually, he agreed to pay the amount to calm Eugene's anger. After settling the initial matter, the Kajitani Emer asked Eugene about what he had seen in the desert. Eugene replied that it was just endless desert, having already stored everything in his cloak's compartments. As long as Amelia Merwin stayed silent, nobody would know what had transpired. Eugene then proposed taking Raman to task for endangering him. The Kajitani Emer suggested executing Rahman, making him anxious. However, Eugene expressed his reluctance to witness someone's execution and instead planned for Rahman to rectify things upon returning home. Ultimately, the Kajitani Emer agreed to this arrangement. In a flashback, we observed numerous deceased soldiers on the ground. A blonde-haired woman was praying for them. Anna's questioned why an omniscient and omnipotent god would allow his followers to spill blood. Amal dismissed Anais suggesting she was just intoxicated. The inebriated Saintess lamented about God not illuminating the world's darkness. Hanwell then shared that he didn't care much about doctrine but trusted Vermeth, a monster-like figure and the acknowledged wielder of the Holy Sword. Hamel speculated that maybe God couldn't directly care for the world, which is why Vermeth was sent down. Anais was taken aback by Hamel's unexpected words. Hamel clarified that his frustration stemmed from seeing Annas drunkenly ramble, he then requested some alcohol from her. Annas refused to share the holy water with a non-believer, but Hamel insisted, claiming he would start believing if she shared some alcohol. Eugene experienced a flashback while gazing at Annas's prayer statue in Hogany, a place reachable by boat from the Holy Empire of Eurus across the sea. Two centuries ago, Annas prayed at this spot and began a journey to the other side of the desert. Eugene was aware that Annas had intended to pay her respects at Hamel's grave. He also knew she embarked on this pilgrimage a few years after Sienna retired. However, Annas never truly reached the interior of Hamel's grave, otherwise it wouldn't be in disarray. Eugene started pondering if Vermouth played a role in Annas's disappearance. Despite searching Hogany, he found no clues except for the world tree leaf left by Sienna. Raman then drew Eugene's attention, mentioning they had been in Hogany for a week and wondered about their next steps. Eugene decided to return to Kiel, to the Lionhearts. Soon after, members of the Lionheart family waited in front of a portal. Cyan expressed annoyance that Eugene had taken a long time outside. Observing Cheyenne's frustrated expression, Ancilla couldn't help but wonder if Cheyenne was displeased about his brother's return. Cyan expressed conflicting feelings, stating that he both wanted his brother back and didn't at the same time. If Eugene aspired to become the patriarch, Cyan was ready to step aside. Ancilla reassured Cyan, urging him not to back down and promising him the position of patriarch. However, Cheyenne believed it would be in the family's best interest for the strongest member to take on the patriarch role. Ancilla then advised her son to make a decision and choose what he truly wanted. Cyan, feeling the weight of Ancilla's expectations, worried about making the right choice. Ancilla sighed, regretting her strict upbringing of Cyan. She realized she didn't want her son to follow the same path as Theonis whose son suffered due to her excessive greed. 
Cyan insisted that he was different from Iode, another family member, and Scylla acknowledged the difference and assured Cyan that she would respect whatever decision he made. She reminded him that he would still be brothers with Eugene and suggested discussing the succession later on. Shortly after, Eugene emerged from the portal and found everyone eagerly awaiting his arrival. He suggested that they could have just met at the house. His father, Gerhard, rushed in with tears in his eyes and embraced his son. Eugene was relieved to see his father in good health and couldn't help but notice the sturdy look, along with the beard resulting from steroid. He reminded his father not to take the medicine from the Muscle Branch family in the first place. Eugene then turned his attention to Mancilla, expressing apologies for the delayed greeting. Ancilla reassured him that it was perfectly fine. Seeking the patriarch, Eugene discovered from Ancilla that Gilar had headed to the Black Lion Castle for a coming-of-age ritual. Reflecting on the exclusive ritual meant for direct lineage children, Eugene recalled that Iode should have undergone it last year, but it was skipped due to his estrangement. Ancilla explained that this year, Eugene, Seal, and Cyan were scheduled for the extravagant ritual. Eugene questioned if Gilar desired it, and Ancilla clarified that it was the Senate's decision. At that moment, Raman emerged from the portal and felt surprised. Ancilla, curious about him, asked Eugene who he was. Eugene introduced Raman as his new assistant, assuring Ancilla that Raman was reliable and would handle various tasks for him. Eugene then summoned Nina, who he hadn't seen in a while. Wow, she looked even more beautiful now. Eugene directed her to teach Raman about the different tasks around the house especially those requiring physical strength. Nina expressed concern about it, and Eugene explained that she was now Raman's senior. Raman questioned whether it was appropriate to treat someone 10 years younger than his senior. However, he realized he had already committed his life to serving Eugene and envisioned a future where he would risk his life alongside Eugene as a warrior. Cyan stepped in and approached Eugene for a chat. As they moved away from others, Cyan asked Eugene a confusing question, leaving our protagonist puzzled. Cyan was unsure if Eugene was truly 19 like him. Eugene responded by saying they weren't the same age because he was a reincarnation. Cyan bluntly told him to stop with the nonsense. Eugene found it interesting that Cyan didn't believe the truth. He pondered whether Cyan questioned him because he was stronger. Seeing Eugene's aura, Cyan started to sweat. Cyan claimed they had trained for the same two years, but Eugene appeared to have aged 20 years. He mentioned his intense physical training while Eugene focused on learning magic, reaching the White Flame method at three stars. However, Eugene had already achieved four stars. Cyan clenched his teeth and urged Eugene to become the family's patriarch. Eugene was curious about what Cyan was talking about. Cyan excitedly said he couldn't be the patriarch because Eugene was better than him in many ways. Eugene casually suggested that Cyan should just become the patriarch if he wanted to, but Cyan couldn't agree with that. Eugene then proposed a duel and promised to accept any decision Cyan made if he won. Cyan, confident, said he would take the position if he won. Eugene didn't anticipate Cyan being clever. Putting jokes aside, Eugene insisted that the patriarch position suited Cyan due to his ambitions. Eugene asserted that he didn't want the position, and if Cyan wanted him to take it, he'd have to force him. Cyan sighed and proposed a sparing match instead. Eugene reminded him that Cyan wouldn't win, no matter what. Cheyenne claimed he knew. Shortly after, everyone from the main house watched the sparring between Eugene and Cyan. Eugene was impressed by Shan's ability to maintain Sword Soul for a long time and his improved mana proficiency. He mentioned that Cyan was a rare case on the continent. On the other hand, Cyan used to be confused about why he got tired so quickly. He realized he had been swinging his sword at nothing. Eugene used to deflect his attacks and sent his sword somewhere he didn't want it to go. Cyan used to grit his teeth as he continued his barrage of sword slashes. Everyone could see that it was a useless effort. One family member wondered if he would have won against Eugene if he had used Sword Soul. However, someone disagreed, and that was Sir Hazer. He used to claim that Eugene had become overwhelmingly stronger after two years. He could see that Cyan had also improved a lot, but Eugene used to casually deflect all of Shan's attacks without moving from his spot. At that moment, Eugene swung his sword in a different way, sending Cheyenne flying. Cyan wondered how Eugene could deflect his attacks, and Eugene said it was just regular parrying, making Cyan doubtful. Cyan argued that it wasn't ordinary because he noticed how Eugene casually let his sword soul slide off, offsetting the attacks and forcing Cyan to use more mana. Eugene praised Cyan's keen eye. Cyan asked how he did it, and Eugene paused, 
mockingly questioning if Cheyenne really wanted to learn from him. Cyan tried to control his anger until Eugene agreed. Cyan was surprised, and Eugene's reason was to make Cyan stronger to be the patriarch. However, he didn't want to teach Cyan with many eyes watching. He told Cyan to follow him. In another part of the mansion grounds, Eugene used to say Cyan wouldn't surpass him, but he had a plan to help Cheyenne become stronger and take over as the patriarch. Eugene insisted he had no interest in being the patriarch himself. Cyan remembered how many times he had offered help to Eugene. Eventually, Cyan agreed to Eugene's plan, only to start pointing out that Eugene didn't have the qualities of a patriarch. Eugene, who came from the countryside, responded by kicking Cyan and calling him a derogatory term. Cyan wondered when Eugene would start teaching him. Due to Eugene's busy schedule, he decided to write down instructions for Cyan to follow instead. Cyan confirmed again that Eugene didn't aspire to be the patriarch. Cyan really had some trust issues. On Mount Euclid, Vermouth still held sway even after relinquishing his title and relocating to a house in the capital. The Black Lion Castle stood proudly on the mountain's peaks, where Vermouth had spent much of his time and where his body now rested. Within the castle's dimly lit halls, members of the Lionheart family gathered around a round table. Gillard read a letter, informing everyone that Eugene had returned to the main house. One member remarked on the convenient timing, with only two months left in the current year. Gillard pondered whether there was an immediate need to summon Eugene. The man then urged Gillard to take responsibility for bringing an indirect lineage child into the main house. Gillard silently reflected on his discomfort around this man, the family's eldest member, and the head of the Lionheart Senate. He was known as the White Lion of Immortality, Doyne's Lionheart. Doyne's had agreed that Gilar had proven Eugene's worth, though it was a bit messy. A woman then stated that it wasn't just Gillard vouching for Eugene. Carmen, who had met Eugene earlier, had no issues with his indirect lineage, believing in his potential. Doyne's acknowledged Carmen's insight, but emphasized that it didn't necessarily reflect the opinions of the Black Lions. He expressed the desire to see what Eugene could achieve in the coming-of-age ceremony. Doines used to say that the Senate thought highly of Eugene. However, Eugene still had to be part of the process to choose the next patriarch. Doines had heard that Eugene visited the Nahana Desert, learned magic in Aeroth, became a disciple at the Red Magic Tower, and even met the Crown Prince. Doines glared at Gillard for letting Eugene, the lion they raised, go wherever he pleased despite being a part of the pack. Gillard argued it was Eugene's choice. Doyne said he respected Eugene's decisions but wanted to set some limits. He wondered if Gillard planned to make Eugene the next patriarch, but Gillard insisted on respecting Eugene's decision on that matter as well. Carmen then told them that Eugene didn't want the patriarch position, as she heard from Seal. Doyne just hoped Eugene wouldn't change his mind. Shortly after, Eugene received instructions to head to Black Lion Castle with Cyan. And Scylla informed them to go, emphasizing that Sheel was already present and urged them to leave as soon as they were prepared. Eugene then instructed Cyan to get ready, and Cyan silently followed suit until he brought up the book Eugene had written for him. Cyan expressed dissatisfaction with the methods described, claiming they were painful for the core and mana. Eugene acknowledged that those were his actions back when he was Hamel. When Cyan struggled with the prospect of crying and vomiting blood, Eugene suggested stopping if it became too much asserting that such hardships were necessary to become a Lionheart Patriarch. Cyan, feeling anxious, couldn't help but curse at Eugene. Cyan had mentioned that it was the first time the coming-of-age ceremony happened in a different location. He knew the Senate was keeping a close watch on them, especially after Iowa became a bastard. He assumed they wanted to teach their batch a lesson, particularly Eugene. Eugene then wondered about Cyan, and this guy claimed he might get congratulated early for becoming the Patriarch, and be allowed to go to Vermouth's great grave. Eugene got serious upon hearing that. Vermouth's grave is somewhere in Mount Euclid, but its precise location is not known, even for the Patriarch. Eugene, as Hamel, knew that Vermouth didn't have a peaceful death, and he needed to make sure that Vermouth's body was really in his grave. Cyan was excited as he thought he would receive either the demonic Spear Ruintos or the pulverizing flail Ziggler. These weapons used to belong to the Demon King of Cruelty and Demon King of Slaughter, stored in the Black Lion Castle. Presently, Doines owns the Demonic Spear Rintos, and his grandson Dominic possesses the Pulverizing Flail Ziggler. Cyan observed the age of the Senate leader and suggested that Doines should retire. He believed that, upon retirement, Doines might hand over the Demonic Spear Rintos to him. In Eugene's room, 
he unsheathed the moonlight sword and noticed that it used to drain his mana each time he pulled it out. The fragment he acquired from the auction perfectly resonated with the sword. Eugene assumed that collecting all the fragments would restore the sword to its normal state. However, he wasn't in a rush and decided to first locate Vermouth's grave. It was surprising for him to leave the main house just a few days after returning. He pondered what to do with Hamel's statue and gravestone stored in his cave. Initially, he planned to set them up in the residence, but Gillard was unavailable. Then, a great idea suddenly occurred to him. Shortly after, Eugene complained about how Cyan appeared as if he were going on a date. However, Cyan pointed out that Eugene looked like he was going on a picnic. Cyan felt envious when he saw the Cape of Darkness, especially noticing the various spells cast on it and the pocket plane. Eugene told him to stop staring, emphasizing that he would never part with the Cape. The duo then headed towards the portal gate that would take them to the Black Lion Castle. Following Eugene's signal, they walked forward. Eugene enjoyed a pleasant breeze upon passing through the gate, while Cyan screamed at the top of his lungs. Eugene just smirked, acknowledging that their beginning was somewhat troublesome. As they fell from the skies, Eugene quickly glanced at the nearby castle, realizing that the elders wanted them to reach it. Eugene saw this as a chance to explore the mountain on the way to the castle. However, Cheyenne was falling nearby, helpless. Eugene understood that falling from the sky marked the beginning of the ceremony, and he assumed there must be a safety measure to prevent them from dying. Deciding to leave Cheyenne behind, Eugene went off on his own, using floating magic to land safely. Meanwhile, in the castle, the elders were observing the two boys. Doines was curious if Eugene had used the Winnet sword, but a nearby mage insisted it was floating magic. Eugene's calm demeanor impressed Doines. He wondered if Eugene was skilled in magic, and the mage mentioned that floating magic was a fourth circle magic. However, judging by Eugene's control and balance, he seemed to be operating at a fifth circle level. Doines then inquired with Gillard about the number of white flame method stars Eugene had earned. Gillard explained that Eugene had already achieved the fourth star. Doines was impressed to learn that Eugene had accomplished such feats at the age of 19. All of a sudden, Klein Lionheart said it might seem silly to someone who hadn't grown up yet. Then, someone told Klein not to criticize others since he was still learning himself. Klein grumbled about how his sister treated him differently now that he was older too. Carmen warned him not to call her sister, pointing out that Klein resembled a grandfather. Klein continued to complain about his sister trying to appear young despite her age. He couldn't understand why someone in their 60s would act like they were a maiden in their 20s. Carmen then bit off her cigar, and Klein realized he had made a mistake. Doines noticed that Eugene had reached the ground and instructed his grandson to leave. As the commander of the Black Lion Knight's First Legion, Dominic followed Doines' orders. Gillard was concerned that the test had started suddenly. Doines wondered if he didn't trust the kids, and Gillard assured him that he did. Doines suggested that the coming-of-age ceremony should have a different difficulty level compared to the bloodline ceremony. Gillard then questioned why Aoud was not included if that was the case. Doines wondered if Gillard still harbored regrets about Iod and advised him to let go of his attachment since Iod was now living comfortably in Gillard's wife's house. Gillard exclaimed that Iod was still his eldest son and had the right to undergo the coming of age ceremony. Doines then informed him that it was unfortunate because Iod had already become an adult. While Eugene was exploring, a fierce orc suddenly appeared. However, Eugene swiftly defeated it as if it were easy. This orc marked the second twin head ogre he had slain. He pondered why such territorial creatures were present in the same area. It dawned on him that the forest served as a breeding ground for these monsters. Observing that the monsters seemed to have unlimited mana, Eugene realized that the elders hadn't simply dropped them from the sky for hunting purposes. Eugene had been walking through the thick forest until he sensed something anticipated. Suddenly, he skillfully dodged an attack from a wyvern. Surprisingly, the monster had reins attached. Eugene then casually inquired Seal on how long she had been riding a wyvern. Seal, taken aback by Eugene effortlessly avoiding her surprise attack, couldn't believe how calm he was. Eugene explained that he dodged due to the noisy wind, but Seal wasn't convinced. Eugene found it hard to believe that after such a long time apart, their reunion was marked by such an absurd encounter. Seal, curious about why Eugene didn't seem bothered, asked why his head wasn't hurting. Eugene, puzzled, learned from Seal that a barrier throughout the forest caused brain fog, making people confused. Eugene then remembered feeling a bit dizzy when he entered the forest. Seal was surprised that was the only effect Eugene experienced, and he boasted about his strong mind. 
Seal clarified that the barrier reflects fears as illusions, breaking one's spirit. She recalled seeing her brother scream and run away from ghost illusions. Eugene smirked, having faced many mental attacks in his past life, and noting that the barrier wasn't intentionally trying to destroy his spirit. Seal admitted she was just trying to scare Eugene, and prepared to unsheathe her sword. Eugene, taken aback, found himself unexpectedly facing off against Seal. Despite the surprise, he assured her that he wouldn't go easy in the upcoming fight. Seal had leaped off her wyvern and went for an attack on Eugene, but he easily blocked her move. Not giving up, Seal kept attacking with her swift moves. Despite Eugene deflecting her again, Seal found herself surrounded by magic while airborne. Realizing she couldn't dodge Eugene's attack, the wyvern roared and flapped its wings fiercely, creating a strong wind that pushed Seal forward. Just in the nick of time, she narrowly dodged Eugene's magic. This unexpected move surprised Eugene. Seal accelerated towards Eugene, attempting a stabbing attack. However, Eugene quickly jumped out of the way. Annoyed, Seal pursued him. Eugene then brought out a whip and skillfully entangled Seal, bringing her down to the ground. Eugene said he caught her, but Seal said it wasn't done. Seal's wyvern attacked from behind, but Eugene avoided its bite. He attempted to slash it, but Seal stopped him, asking not to harm her wyvern, which had a cute nickname. Eugene was surprised by the odd name, and Seal cried like a child. Eugene couldn't believe how bold Seal was, considering she attacked first. He told the wyvern it was fortunate, but it still attacked. Eugene responded with a kick, knocking its head. He leaped above the wyvern and punched its head, bringing the wyvern to the ground. Seal became upset and unleashed sword soul in her frustration. She jumped forward, attempting to stab Eugene. However, Eugene calmly tried to block the attack using his bare hands. Surprised by his response, Seal quickly moved her sword aside. Eugene seized the opportunity, grabbing her arm and subduing her from behind, pinning his stepsister to the ground. In a cute manner, Seal asked him to take it easy, but Eugene insisted she stop attacking first. Frustrated by her inability to defeat Eugene, Seal sighed. With a smile, Eugene released his grip on Seal, Wondering if Eugene had anticipated her changing the sword's direction, Seal asked. Eugene confidently claimed he had simply taken a gamble. Seal exclaimed that Eugene could have risked losing his hand, but Eugene was confident that she wouldn't dare to go that far. Surprised by their unexpected encounter, Eugene asked for an explanation. Seal annoyingly instructed him to just locate the castle, but Eugene was already aware of that and expressed his frustration with the process. Seal then clarified that there were 60 Black Lion Knights, including the captains, spread across the mountain in search of Eugene and Cyan. Eugene found it excessive for a simple coming-of-age ceremony. Seal explained that the Senate highly valued Eugene, and poor Cheyenne was just pulled along with him. Eugene argued that 60 people were too many for just two individuals. Seal elaborated that their goal was not only to ambush, but also to block specific areas that Eugene and Cheyenne shouldn't enter. Eugene then realized something crucial, one of those restricted places must be Vermeth's grave. Eugene had asked Seal about the places they were planning to visit. Seal explained that they should go to places filled with dangerous monsters, including demonic creatures. Eugene looked visibly shocked and questioned why demons were in that area. Seal clarified that it was for the Black Lion Knights to gain experience. Eugene expressed disgust, arguing that demons shouldn't be domesticated and found in the mountains housing Vermeth's grave. Seal wondered why Eugene was so upset, and he explained that it was because he was a Lionheart. Seal found it suspicious that Eugene suddenly became patriotic toward the Lionhearts, and mentioned having participated in demon raids that proved the demons were far from Vermith's grave. Eugene, realizing the Senate leader was watching him, understood that investigating the mountain for the grave could be risky. As a result, he decided to go for Plan B, heading to the Black Lion Castle. As Seal rode her wyvern, Eugene wondered if he could join her on the ride. Seal said no and reminded him to leave quickly because other knights would be arriving soon. Eugene questioned if that was true and tried to grab Seal. Startled, Seal jumped off her wyvern. Eugene then generated wind and pushed Seal away. Taking control of the wyvern's reins, Eugene surprised the poor creature. Acting like a thug, Eugene threatened the wyvern to fly for him. The wyvern obeyed, soared high into the sky, and passed by Seal, who was still airborne. She returned to the ground and scolded her pet wyvern to come back, but Eugene continued intimidating the poor lizard. At that moment, Eugene's eyes widened when he encountered other knights riding wyverns. He couldn't spot Carmen, and the faces of the other captains were unfamiliar to him. 
However, he observed that none of the knights in front of him appeared strong enough to be one. The leader of the attacking group instructed the others not to launch aggressive attacks since they were conducting a test. Eugene recognized the impressive skills of the Black Lion Order and remembered that no other order had been as formidable in his previous life. However, attacks without the intention to murder couldn't truly test Eugene. So he made up his mind to evaluate the Black Lion Order instead. Eugene had jumped off Seal's wyvern, catching the knights off guard. They tried to intervene, and archers started shooting arrows at him. But Eugene skillfully used his cape of darkness to absorb the arrows. Rolling midair, he redirected the arrows back at the knights, who managed to deflect them easily. However, Eugene swiftly appeared behind them, blocking their attacks and using his strength to push them off the wyverns. Suddenly, a bearded Lionheart, Nathan Lionheart, charged at Eugene with a spear. Eugene recognized him as the third Legion vice captain he had met in Iroth. As they exchanged spear attacks, Nathan wondered where Eugene left Seal. Eugene reassured him that Seal was safe somewhere, then revealed a spear hidden in his cape. The intense spear fight between Eugene and Nathan ensued, with Nathan eventually being pushed back, surprised at losing in a spear duel. Rather unexpectedly, Eugene decided not to waste time engaging in battle and flew off toward the direction of the castle. However, a boulder came flying towards him, and Eugene narrowly dodged it. To his surprise, it came from the ground. Suddenly, someone greeted him from behind and delivered a powerful kick. Damn, look at those flexible legs. Eugene then used floating magic to stop before hitting the ground. The woman who kicked him also came down to the ground. Eugene knew that the captains were testing them, but he didn't expect to see the third legion's captain, Carmen Lionheart. Carmen wondered if her greeting had been a bit rough. Her subordinates followed suit. Eugene was surprised that she was giving him too much attention and Carmen explained that Eugene was doing better compared to Cyan, who was still struggling with his fears. She assured Eugene that things would be fine now that she had tested him. Carmen suggested surviving her attacks for three minutes, and Eugene was taken aback by her proposition. Carmen wondered if Eugene just wanted a minute. Eugene laughed and felt offended, glaring at Carmen. He worried that an old hag like her couldn't keep up with a youngster for three minutes. Carmen flinched, and her subordinates trembled in fear. Carmen tossed the pocket watch to Nathan and declared that one minute was fine. She then assumed a stance that exerted pressure around her while exuding a white flame aura. Eugene did the same as he unsheathed his sword. Carmen began the fight with a flying kick, but Eugene swiftly blocked her move and attempted a counterattack. Carmen easily deflected his sword with her bare arms and retaliated by sending Eugene flying. Despite this, Eugene remained composed and unshaken, revealing a second sword. Carmen, impressed by Eugene's quick reaction, had initially intended to cause harm but was surprised by his agility. This led her to reconsider and take the situation more seriously. Carmen had begun attacking once more, but Eugene effortlessly deflected her fist. Trying to counterattack with his sword, Eugene found Carmen blocking again, this time with her bare arm. She attempted another punch, but Eugene parried with his sword, momentarily disrupting Carmen's balance. Soon, she unleashed a flurry of punches and kicks on Eugene, who could only defend himself, marveling at Carmen's impressive skills. Considering her intimidating presence, Eugene wondered if Carmen was on par with Amelia Merwin. However, he couldn't be certain, as Amelia had attacked with a clear intent to murder. Eugene felt disappointed that Carmen seemed to be holding back. Contemplating the use of Hamel's ignition skill, Carmen threw a powerful punch, shattering Eugene's sword. Nevertheless, Eugene claimed that three minutes had already passed and discarded his broken weapon. Carmen was surprised that despite controlling her strength, she hadn't been able to land a critical attack during that time. Frustrated, she couldn't believe she was struggling against a kid like Eugene. In her anger, Carmen insisted there was still a minute left, but Eugene countered that he had been keeping track in his head. Carmen questioned if he had really counted while fighting and Eugene asserted that he could pointing out that Carmen's holding back had allowed him to do so. Someone had started applauding and called Eugene amazing. Eugene then noticed a familiar weapon behind the man. It was the pulverizing hammer Ziggelard. This meant that the man in front of him was Dominic Lionheart, the captain of the First Legion. Dominic was impressed to see someone so young be skilled, after initially thinking that the rumors were exaggerated. Eugene respectfully thanked him. Dominic then wondered if Carmen would test Eugene further, but Mommy claimed it was enough and suggested going to the castle. Shortly after, the stepsister began scolding Eugene while riding her pet wyvern. Eugene was amazed at how clever the wyvern was as it quickly located Seal. 
He was relieved that Seal arrived on time because he needed a ride to the castle. Flustered, Seal asked if Eugene really wanted to ride the wyvern with her. Eugene wondered if Shield didn't want him to, that Sendir's stepsister insisted she didn't mind. Eugene then rode Seal's wyvern, following the other knights. Seal instructed him to stay close to avoid falling, but Eugene confidently claimed he wouldn't die even if he fell. Seal pointed out that Eugene was hurting her wyvern by holding onto its scales, but Eugene didn't care. Seal explained that her pet was sensitive, and Eugene believed her, opting to hold onto her waist instead. The stepsister was visibly happy and began making her wyvern fly around. Eugene questioned what she was doing, and Seal mentioned that it would be enjoyable to fly around for fun on the way to the castle. Eugene just wanted to get to the castle to eat and take a bath, but Seal informed him that he would receive lectures instead. Shortly after, Eugene found himself trailing Carmen through a hallway. Carmen mentioned the scarcity of members in the Black Lion Knight Order, expressing her disappointment in their insufficient representation of the esteemed Lionheart family. Eugene explained that it was inevitable, given that the Black Lions were exclusively comprised of family members, unlike the White Lion Knight Order of the main house. Carmen divulged that the Black Lions were tasked with handling the family's discreet affairs meant to be kept away from outsiders. Despite Eugene's earlier refusal two years ago, Carmen extended another invitation for him to join the Black Lion Knight Order. Eugene reminded her of his previous rejection, but Carmen, impressed by Eugene's recent skills, proposed the position of the Second Legion Captain's Disciple. Curious about the events of the past two years, Eugene inquired, and Carmen revealed that the Second Captain had found someone but dismissed him due to his rough personality. She drew parallels between Eugene's skills and the Second Captain's, believing they would complement each other, bringing more honor to the family. Eugene, however, prioritized his personal honor over such offers. Carmen warned him about the Senate's suspicions stemming from his recent actions in Nahama. Although Eugene insisted he wouldn't conspire with the Nahama people, Carmen expressed concerns about the unexpected discovery of Io delving into dark magic. Aware of Eugene's limited authority due to his bloodline, Carmen considered the possibility of someone assisting him in becoming the Patriarch. Eugene, uninterested in such matters, dismissed Carmen's speculations. Carmen continued exploring other possibilities, suggesting that Nahama's sultan might have promised Eugene wealth and fame. Eugene, feeling like he was being interrogated, smirked and refused to provide answers. Their conversation ceased as they reached the door of a room where individuals inside would likely pose similar questions. The door swung open, and Eugene found himself facing the solemn gazes of the important members of the Lionheart family. Senate head Doines Lionheart, Patriarch Gillard, and other Senate members like Clean. A rare Lionheart mage, Dominic and Sinos were all there waiting for him. Eugene greeted them respectfully and introduced himself formally. To everyone's surprise, he then opened his cape of darkness, revealing Hamel's statue and gravestone. Doines and Gillard fell silent, while Klein looked puzzled at the gravestone. Doines stood up abruptly and approached the gravestone. Reading the name on it, Hamel Dines, he asked Eugene where he had found it. Eugene claimed it was from Hamel's grave. This revelation shocked Gillard, who asked if it was Hamel the Foolish. Hinos was also taken aback by this unexpected discovery. Eugene reminded them about his two-year study of magic in Eroth. During that time, he learned about Hamel's grave through Senya's witchcraft. He said it was the first time someone from the Lionheart family had the chance to witness the witchcraft, and he assumed Senya intended for all of them to see it. According to Eugene, Hamel was a great ancestor's friend who sacrificed himself for his friends. Eugene's inner Hamel cringed at these words. Eugene mentioned wandering around Nahama Desert until he found Hamel's grave. He described the grave as completely ruined except for the intact statue and gravestone. He also shared information about Hamel's body transforming into a death knight after Amelia Merwin tampered with it. The Lionheart Mage was shocked that Eugene encountered the death answer, but managed to return alive. With a great expression, Eugene insisted that it had all happened because of the intervention of the Demon King incarceration. Gillard and Klein became nervous when they found out that the notorious Demon King was present. Eugene went on to explain that the Demon King had prevented Amelia from murdering him and issued a warning to the Lionhearts. He repeated the same message about his goodwill having limits. Doines was left speechless. Eugene, unaware of the pact between the Demon King and Vermouth, felt the need to share the warning. He continued by conveying the Demon King's words about the obligation to reciprocate respect only if it was given in the first place. Doines broke into a cold sweat and went back to his seat. 
He and the others had just planned to ask Eugene about what he had done recently, but everything changed because of the unexpected news he brought. Klein suggested they should keep being friendly with the Demon King to maintain peace, but Gillard pointed out that the warning meant the peace they enjoyed wouldn't last much longer. He also reminded everyone about Nahama's centuries-long invasion of Chirath, hinting at the likelihood that the Demon King was involved. Doines had wondered if Gillard was interested in personally talking to the Demon King of Incarceration. He also thought that the recent peaceful times wouldn't last because the continent still had the two strongest demon kings, and their kin and dark mages were scattered everywhere. He knew from records that even Vermouth couldn't do much against the remaining demon kings, making him question if there was a hero like Lionheart in their time to defeat them. Gillard reminded him that it wasn't just about their family but the entire world. Doines in turn emphasized that as descendants of Vermouth, they should take the lead. He pondered whether they were truly prepared for such a war. Klein added that it wasn't their family disrespecting the Demon King of Incarceration, but rather those from the Holy Empire and Allied Powers stationed on the Helmut borders. He suspected that these two groups would invade Helmut upon hearing the warning. Doines believed that these groups were just putting on a show and would retreat if things became serious. The Senate members were discussing, and Eugene found their conversation to be slow. He wasn't concerned about them declaring war on Helmut, because his goal of defeating the remaining Demon Kings wouldn't change. Doines then wondered what he should do with Hamel's statue and gravestone. Eugene suggested placing it where their ancestor was buried. He then showed how damaged the gravestone was, and Doines began reading the insults written on it about Hamel. Eugene's inner Hamel felt attacked and told Doines to read the messages below, which were about the noble sacrifice Hamel made for his friends. Eugene argued that Vermouth genuinely mourned for Hamel, and it would be right to lead the statue and gravestone beside Vermouth. He reminded them that his mentor, Roberian, was technically a distant disciple of Senya, making Eugene a distant mentee of Senya too. He stated that he was both a descendant of Vermouth and a mentee of Senya, and the last person to have paid respects to Hamel. He offered to bring the statue and gravestone to Vermouth's grave himself. Doines understood Eugene's suggestion, but he insisted that he couldn't allow anyone to enter Vermouth's grave. Surprisingly, Gillard agreed to let Hamel's gravestone lay beside their ancestor. Carmen noted that Eugene was the one who found them and predicted that he would be the one to lead them to their ancestor. Subsequently, Doines agreed to open the path to their ancestor's grave. Eugene was relieved that there was no need to sneak around the mountains. Although he couldn't open it with the others around, he could always return later after memorizing the path and the area. Since they were still planning to open the path, Doines suggested keeping the statue and gravestone in the meantime. Eugene agreed, curious if the path was sealed or something, requiring time. Doines then told Sinos to take Eugene to his room, instructing Gillard to postpone the reunion with his sons for further discussion. Silently, Eugene followed Sinos, who had a reputation for disciples running away due to his personality. Sinos directed Eugene to a place to show the statue and gravestone once more. Wondering why, Eugene noticed tears streaming down Sinos' face like a river. When asked, Sinos claimed it was due to conjunctivities but Eugene found his sudden behavior strange and unsettling. Later, Zenos presented flowers and knelt before Hamel's statue and gravestone. Eugene, embodying Hamel's spirit, observed as Zenos sobbed. Intrigued, Eugene wondered if Zenos could be his descendant, though he quickly dismissed the possibility, as he believed he never had any children. Curiosity got the better of Eugene, and he approached Zenos, inquiring about any connection to Hamel. Zenos, standing up with a serious expression and red eyes, asserted that he was Hamel's disciple. This puzzled Eugene, as he had never taken on any students in his previous life. Xenos clarified that he didn't directly learn from Hamel himself. According to Xenos, his lineage branched off from the main family, and his ancestor was Vermith's second son. Since the eldest son became the patriarch, many siblings, including Xenos' ancestors, left the main residence to establish their own indirect lineages. As the main family already possessed the traditional white flame method, Vermouth personally taught Hamel's techniques to the second son's family. This revelation surprised Eugene. Sienos had asked Eugene whether he had discovered the secret technique in Hamel's grave. He had witnessed the duel between Eugene and Carmen, realizing that the way Eugene deflected Carmen's punch was one of Hamel's techniques passed down through his family from Vermouth. According to Xenos, this move required genius combat senses and a profound understanding and control over mana. Eugene found it hard to believe that Vermouth had taught these skills to his descendants 300 years ago. He questioned why Vermouth would pass on Hamel's techniques to his second son. 
Zian has explained that the proliferation of many families led to the emergence of some individuals with questionable motives, and it was Eugene's ancestor who had judged and convicted those people. Eugene then grasped that Vermouth had raised his second son as a watchdog to keep an eye on other families. He assumed Vermouth considered his techniques as valuable as the white flame method, prompting him to pass them down through the generations. Zenos had asked for the secret text that Eugene found in Hamel's grave. Eugene scratched his neck, trying to explain. He said he was Hamel's direct disciple, which confused Zenos. Eugene clarified that despite the age gap, he was the senior and Zenos was the junior. Zenos assumed there were secret texts in Hamel's grave, but Eugene claimed to have burned them after memorizing everything. He recounted being attacked by the Death Knight, which prevented him from bringing out the texts. Eugene offered to share the missing concepts from known techniques if Zenos treated him as a senior brother. Zenos doubted Eugene's memory of the techniques, mixing casual and formal speech. Zenos made Eugene angry, as he could recall Amelia. Zenos worried about calling him senior in front of others. Eugene claimed it would attract trouble and suggested doing it privately. Despite hesitation, Zenos referred to Eugene as his senior brother. Eugene then instructed Zenos to take him to his room. Later in his room, Eugene listened as Zenos listed down the ten techniques inherited from Vermouth by Hamel. Eugene, embodying his inner Hamel, wondered if that was a lot, considering he could only recall naming ignition. Wanting to know more, Eugene asked Zenos to describe all the techniques. Zenos began with ignition, known as the Hamel Method's principle, but Eugene quickly told him to pause. Feeling a bit embarrassed, Eugene questioned whether Vermouth had named the techniques himself. Zenos wasn't sure, as that's how they had always learned them. Eugene's inner Hamel couldn't help but curse Vermouth for not thinking of better names. Setting embarrassment aside, Eugene urged Xenos to continue. From the first to the ninth technique, they were as follows. Mana pairing, thousand thunders, light encounter, azure rampage, dragon burst, cyclone, dead end, destructive divine key, and eternal purgatory. Eugene's inner Hamel cringed upon hearing these names as they represented a dark chapter in his life. In a memory, Hamel happily shouted azure rampage while cutting demons into pieces. Senya asked why the technique had such a fancy name when Hamel seemed to be swinging his sword randomly. Hamel teased Senya about his magic spell names. Senya, feeling embarrassed, explained that chanting was part of casting the spell. Hamel also mentioned Anais using Holy Cross, and Anais claimed she could at least make a cross out of the light. She wondered if shouting a name like Azura Rampage made Hamel feel stronger. Hamel confirmed that he did feel more powerful when shouting a technique's name. Moron agreed, saying he could see Hamel as an Azura when he did that. Hamel was pleased that Moron understood. Eugene used to feel embarrassed about his younger self and eventually stopped using those techniques after a few years. He couldn't believe Vermouth had memorized all those unimpressive names and taught them to his son. In the past, Eugene would proudly announce the technique and Vermouth would watch him attentively. That's how those skills were passed down for 300 years, with Zeno's ancestors shouting the names on the training grounds. Eugene couldn't help but cringe at the thought. He wished he had just regressed instead of reincarnating, so he could have destroyed the past Hamel with his own hands. Zenos then wondered if the technique names were the same in the text Eugene found. Hamel then said the book didn't have any of those lame embarrassing names. Hearing that, Zenos got angry at Eugene for looking down on them. Eugene clarified that he respected Hamel, but what he found embarrassing was the names, not the skills. Eugene asked Zenos to swear from his heart if he didn't think the names were embarrassing to shout. Zenos then remembered something and claimed that Carmen's ultimate attack was called Destiny Breaker. Knowing that someone had worse naming sense, Eugene finally felt better and asked Zenos to write down the details until he could correct the wrong parts. While Zenos wrote down the techniques and their details, Eugene asked him if he ever went inside Vermouth's grave. Sinos then said it happened only once when he became a captain, along with other newly appointed captains. They went there to swear allegiance to protect the family. Eugene was curious about the place, and Sinos cautioned him not to get his hopes up. He couldn't go into details but mentioned it was somewhat like a temple. They believed Vermeth had ascended as a god after his death, and the temple might have been established for worship. Eugene considered Vermeth as a god, which seemed plausible. If Vermeth was a god, he should have reincarnated Hamel. However, in that case, he shouldn't have fought with Senya. Zenos had just finished jotting down the techniques and their details. Eugene carefully read through everything and expressed his dissatisfaction, calling everything a mess. 
he believed that changes had been made to address inconvenient parts. Eugene asserted that they were different and sat down to make corrections. Initially, he erased the name Hamill method, prompting a question from Sinos. Eugene explained that the method wasn't that great and shouldn't have its own name. Being tied to it, he argued, would limit one's ability to surpass their boundaries. Eugene suggested moving away from the Hamill method they had learned. This led Zenos to question whether Eugene had truly mastered the Hamill method. Eugene stated firmly that he wouldn't be making corrections if he hadn't mastered it. Despite Eugene's assurance, Zenos continued to doubt whether Eugene truly understood Hamill's techniques. Eugene sighed and stood up, telling Zenos to pay close attention. He unsheathed his sword and used Sword Soul, gathering energy at the tip of his blade, making it larger. With a small movement, the huge aura exploded and compressed like a black hole. Xenos couldn't believe how easily Eugene cast the Nent technique, Eternal Purgatory, despite the high mana consumption. Eugene wondered if Xenos was satisfied, and Xenos respectfully asked for destructive divine key too. Eugene handed over the corrected details and told Xenos to do it himself. But before giving him the paper, he instructed Xenos to reject others like Carmen if they asked him to take Eugene as his disciple. Zenos wondered if he should, and Eugene made it clear that he was the senior brother. Zenos tried to bring up recruiting black lions, but Eugene threatened him by not giving him the corrected techniques. Soon after, Eugene sat down for lunch, devouring his food like a wild man. Sheel watched him with curiosity, eyeing him as if he were her next meal. She pondered about Eugene's conversation with Zenos, wondering what they had discussed. Eugene mentioned that he had only learned a little. Seal Len questioned whether Eugene was truly close to the Prince of Aerath, or if he had been introduced by Roberian as a promising mage. Eugene insisted that he wasn't one for socializing. Seal also mentioned that Cyan would be busy for the next year as he was to be introduced as the successor of the Lionheart family. She added that Cyan was being considered as a potential match for marriage by the two princesses from the Sea Kingdom, Simuen, and the Lunar Kingdom. This would make Cyan the first among the three siblings to be married. Eugene then remembered that the Lunar Kingdom was established by Moron. The realization that the princess was a descendant of Moron made Eugene shudder at the thought of a female version of Moron. Cyan was taken aback by Eugene's reaction, breaking out into a nervous sweat. Impressed by Cyan's early arrival, Eugene inquired about his encounter with the forest ghosts, causing Cyan to tremble in fear. Cyan recounted his struggles against illusions, monsters, and knights, unable to believe that Eugene had reached the castle just an hour after they had been separated. All of a sudden, a maid rushed in with an important message. She said a guest had arrived and told the siblings to go to the warp gate to welcome them. Seal said they hadn't anticipated any guests, and the maid clarified that it was a sudden visit decided during the family elders' conference. Eugene wondered who this visitor was that they had to personally greet. The maid then mentioned it was Christina, the auxiliary bishop from the Holy Empire Eurus. Hmm? Why does her back look familiar? The Lionheart family members had headed to the warp gate to greet some unexpected guests. Out came knights wearing uniforms that represented the Holy Empire. Eugene felt nervous when he realized that the woman in front of him was the spitting image of the familiar drunken saintess, Annas. Christina expressed gratitude to everyone for the warm welcome. Doines admitted he hadn't anticipated Christina coming in person. She insisted that she should answer any summons it needed and ask them to lead the way for their discussion. As Christina walked away with the elders, the siblings observed and Eugene couldn't help but stare. Christina paused in her steps, turning to Eugene with a calming smile that made his heart flutter. She then continued walking, leaving Seal to wonder if they had met before. Eugene stated that it was his first time seeing her. The stepsister appeared visibly jealous after witnessing Christina's friendly smile towards Eugene. That night, Eugene enjoyed a cup of coffee and remembered that Christina Rogeris was the adopted daughter of one of the three cardinals of the Holy Empire Eurus. She was also a saintess in a long line of successors after Ennis. At that time, she was just a candidate for the position of saintess, and Eugene assumed she would officially take the title in a few years. Suddenly, a maid knocked on his door and informed him about a guest. Eugene thought it might be Xenos, but to his surprise, it was Christina. They greeted each other outside his room, and Eugene wondered why she didn't have any guards. Christina explained that she had received a divine revelation from the God of Light. Eugene questioned it, as he wasn't a believer. Christina couldn't share details with him, but mentioned their meeting was guided by God. Eugene was curious, 
and Christina revealed that the Lionheart elders had concluded their meeting. They decided that Eugene would accompany her after deciding to open the doors to the grave. She came over to inform Eugene and go with him. As the two strolled down the hallway, Eugene posed a question. He was curious if the Saintess role had been inherited through a family line. Christina couldn't fathom why Eugene was asking such a thing. Eugene then disclosed that he had studied magic in Senya's hall and stumbled upon paintings depicting Senya and her companions from 300 years ago. According to him, everyone, including Annas the Faithful, was present, and he thought Christina bore a striking resemblance to Anais. Christina, for some reason, smiled in a calm yet eerie manner and thanked Eugene for the compliment. Eugene noticed she wasn't surprised, assuming that the priests from the Holy Empire had already informed her about the likeness. Christina pondered if it was a miracle of God that someone could see Annas in someone as ordinary as her. She wondered how much Eugene knew about her, and he admitted he only knew about her candidacy and adoption. Christina explained that she was abandoned as a child, left in a basket in front of an abbey. She confessed to not knowing much about her lineage, but speculated that Annas might be her ancestor due to the resemblance. Eugene mentioned hearing that Annas had no children, but Christina countered that Annas, being human, might have desired a child. Christina questioned if her answers were sufficient and suggested they move on. Eugene couldn't fathom a woman like Annas, who seemed snake-like, having a family but considered the possibility during her pilgrimage. He then thought that probing Christina about ancestors she knew nothing about might be uncomfortable. Exiting the main castle building, they continued their silent walk. Eugene remarked on the cold and offered a hooded shawl to Christina, who graciously accepted and wrapped it around herself. Eugene inquired if they were heading to the Tower of the Round Table, but Christina corrected him, stating their destination was the back of the castle, leading to Vermouth's grave. As the two walked outside the castle, Christina talked about Eugene's fascination with heroes from 300 years ago. She mentioned that Hogani, a part of Nahama, was appointed as the Holy Land of the Empire. Eugene had recently visited there, and he noticed many eyes on him. He wondered if the Holy Empire was interested because of a divine revelation, but Christina couldn't share any information. Eugene thought about it a lot, and Christina hinted that it was her goal to make him think about it. Eugene couldn't believe Christina had the same difficult personality as Anais. He remembered how, despite facing hardships together, Annis never talked about her past. Hamill noticed something off about Christina when Holy Empire Cardinals were mentioned. Annis clearly disliked her past. In the present, Christina said they had reached their destination, Vermouth's grave. Eugene wondered if she meant jumping off the cliff, and she confirmed, warning him not to use flight magic. Eugene was puzzled, and Christina said he'd understand during the fall. She asked him to take her hand, and Eugene grabbed it. Christina then leaped off the cliff, pulling Eugene with her. She used a cross to create angel wings on her back, resembling an ice. Eugene was taken aback, telling Christina he saw an angel. Christina thought he might have taken drugs, explaining it was a light spell called Divine Wings, not a high-level one that turns someone into an angel. Eugene couldn't shake off the image of Annis from his mind. Christina had claimed they arrived, and suddenly, Eugene found himself in the middle of an empty plain. Christina checked the grass, saying it lacked life energy. Eugene explained it was spatial magic, likely created by Senya or Vermouth. They walked until reaching Vermouth's grave, with a proud statue of Vermouth in front. Doines and Gilar greeted them, praising the beautiful place as suitable for Lionhearts to worship the mausoleum. Doines suggested placing Hamel's statue there to reunite the old friends. After greeting Christina, Doines explained the place could only be opened with acknowledgement from the Patriarch and the Senate. Vermouth's instructions allowed visits only during Patriarch successions and appointments of new Black Lions commanders. Christina noted this was a unique situation and apologized for her rudeness, mentioning she had come for an important reason. Gillard had spoken up, expressing that Christina's timing was inappropriate and deeming her insistence on following his son into the mausoleum as rude. Despite being the patriarch, he could have overlooked Christina's stubbornness, but he considered the Holy Empire's alliance with the Kiel Empire and the lineage of Vermeth. Aware of the recent warning from the Demon King of Incarceration, he wanted to understand why Christina, who came because of God's revelation, was keeping something to herself. In response, Christina boldly announced and revealed her secret, brandishing her scepter. She swore upon her name and official position as the Saintess, urging them to open the great hero's grave. The two elders were taken aback by her unexpected request. She exclaimed that the great hero's soul had not gone to heaven and had been wandering the earth. 
Her goal was to check Vermouth's last moments. Doyne then let Gilard decide as the patriarch. Gilard couldn't believe that he would be the one to open their great ancestor's grave. Eugene and Christina then followed Gilard inside. Christina commented on how mystical the subspace was and how barren the inside of the temple looked. Gilard claimed it was Vermouth's will not to make his grave a symbol for worship. If they followed his will, they should not let Hamel's statue be put inside. Christina claimed it would be beautiful to connect a brotherly love from 300 years ago. She said it was also God's will for Eugene to come. Eugene then wondered if defaming Hamel's grave and turning his body into a death knight was also God's will. Christina turned toward him silently and claimed that it was not. It was the part where Eugene illuminated the darkness in the grave. Eugene found her reasoning amazing. Even Anais didn't have the thick skin to use God this much. Gilard had halted, claiming they had arrived. He instructed them to observe as he opened the coffin. Eugene silently stared from a distance, finding it hard to believe he could see Vermith's coffin so quickly. He simply wished that Vermith lay inside, lifeless. If Vermith was there, Eugene's inner Hamel would be relieved, easing any suspicions towards Vermith. He hoped Vermith had no connection to his reincarnation or Senya's escape. Eugene also disliked how the Demon King spoke as if he were Vermith's best friend. He refused to entertain those suspicions, as he held Vermith in high regard as the Great. Hamel needed assurance that Vermith was truly gone to dispel any doubts. The coffin opened, and Gilard couldn't believe what he saw. Christina thought the coffin would be empty. Eugene got angry, clenching his fist and gritting his teeth. Gilard wondered if Vermith had gone into hiding, and Christina suggested they could only assume that. Then, Christina called out Eugene, revealing her discovery. She declared him the next hero to succeed the great Vermith. Despite the Demon King of Incarceration's warning, they wouldn't make an official announcement yet, but as the same test, Christina would be with Eugene. Confused, Gilard didn't understand what Christina meant. She assumed that Eugene was Vermith's reincarnation. If that were true, she believed it because Vermith's soul didn't enter heaven. To face the upcoming danger, Vermith's soul was supposedly reincarnated in his descendant's body. Eugene couldn't help but laugh at the revelation he found absurd. He expressed his anger, telling Christina to stop her nonsense. Gilard was surprised, seeing this side of Eugene for the first time. Eugene then told Christina that calling him the reincarnation of the hero felt like harassment. Christina claimed it was just her thoughts and asked him not to disregard God's revelation. Eugene said he didn't plan to believe in the revelation since he was Eugene Lionheart. He suggested finding a replacement hero as long as it wasn't him. To convince people he was the hero, he recommended having the Almighty God personally descend to Earth. Eugene looked at his surprised adopted father and apologized for his harsh words. He firmly stated that he wouldn't become the hero, nor did he want to be the Patriarch or join the Black Lion Knight's order. He explained that he was avoiding these paths to avoid dishonoring the family and hoped Gilard would continue supporting him. Nervously, Gilard agreed to respect Eugene's decisions. Eugene smiled calmly and asked Christina to convey a message to her almighty god of light. He told her to tell them to go away and flashed a middle finger. Gilard was shocked, but Christina just stared at him blankly. Eugene then turned his attention away and stated he would go back to sleep. When Gilard inquired about Hamel's statue, Eugene mentioned that Hamel might not want to rest where his comrade was missing. Wearing a more angry expression than usual, Eugene walked away. That's it for season two. Give this video a like and subscribe for more videos. Thanks for watching and see you next time.